Um, thank you very much, and um, good morning, everybody. Um, we, I hope, have a really interesting panel discussion. It's going to be quite a short session, so it's going to be a bit quick fire, I, I hope. Um, I'm David Batchelor from the Cesar Joint Undertaking. As I'm sure many of you know, the Cesar Joint Undertaking was asked back in 2016 or so by the European Commission uh, to develop the, a blueprint for U-Space, which we delivered um, in the first half of 2017. And then following that, the European Commission mandated the Cesar Joint Undertaking to manage uh, U-Space research and development activities at European level. And we launched uh, nine exploratory research projects and 10 demonstration projects, so 19 projects in total. Uh, the aim of this session is really to um, take stock and look at what progress has been made in those projects. They all either have been completed or are, are about to be completed, and we'll be publishing something early next year which brings together the results of all of those projects. But I want to, uh, um, with the panelists, uh, discuss the level of maturity we've reached uh, and also to discuss a bit what lies ahead in terms of things to be done. I won't introduce the panel uh, as a whole right now. We'll, we'll go one by one. Um, the first is Andrew Haightley from Eurocontrol. So I'm just, and I know each, each panelist has one or two slides just to give a quick uh, review of, um, of the, the projects which they've been involved in. We're not going to discuss, discuss all 19 projects, but we've picked a, a selection to highlight uh, in this session. So, Andrew, over to you. Okay, so I was coordinating the content of the Chorus project, which set about writing a concept of operations for use space. We had a consortium of nine um, partners. We had an advisory board. We had access to the members of the other research projects. And we created a stakeholder network. So we consulted among 600 people who had an, an interest. We made three revisions of the CONOPS, and we finally came up with what is summarized here on this page, which is a kind of the essential, that there are different environments uh, where you have um, not much service, where you have separation pre-flight, and where you have separation pre-flight and in-flight. And we describe how this is done, how it works, what the obligations are, and, and what the benefits are. So the CONOPS is finished, it's available. It was the reference for the other projects. We were the transversal project for the other research projects. And I, I would encourage anybody who's interested to download it, look at it, and if you have comments, I'm interested to hear them. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Can, can I just ask, because I know that the CONOPS, you said it was finished, <coughs> and the CONOPS, of course, evolved. I know there's a first edition, second edition, the, third edition. The, the project is finished. We yes. have no more money. But uh, <laughs> we have lots of ideas for how we could take it further, um, but the means isn't there at the moment. We're hoping that we'll find a way to, to maintain the project, uh, the CONOPS in future. There are loads of things that we were not able to do, for example, to deal with integration, to have a conversation with manned aviation about such things as uh, collaborative detect and avoid. Uh, so there's, there are many things still left to do, but for the moment, the project is over. Okay, I'm sure we'll come back to some aspects of, of that in a moment. And next, we have Thomas Lutz from Frequentis. And Thomas, I know you've been heavily involved in the um, Goff project. Do you want to say a few words about that? Um, hello, everybody. Um, as you can see, it was a quite busy project. There's a lot of text up there, just to wrap it up in a nutshell. Um, we took it from operator's perspective. So what do operators want? What do they need? Um, what do they want to achieve to make their business work. And we had seven demonstrations focusing on seven different scenarios. Um, from scenarios down down involving public safety to infrastructure scanning um, out in the forest. Um, some interesting scenarios with mixed traffic, including general aviation. Um, and we did not only fly, but we found out that in order to fly, and we've heard that many times today, you need to share information. So Next to the demonstrations, the real world stuff, we wrote um, craft documents on how information exchange could work. Um, what we've seen, it's possible to connect systems. We had three USBs in the project, um, and they're sitting here, uh, one of them. It's possible to integrate, it's possible to share the situation overview. Um, some things worked really well, some things need a bit of love, but I think we're getting close. Okay, thank you very much. 
And next, in this quick fire run through some of our projects, we have Christian Cantaloup from um, Talis, who's going to say a few words about GeoSafe. Yes, Ge GeoSafe project was about uh, geofencing. Uh, geofencing is now called uh, geo-awareness in the regulation. Uh, so it's about uh, preventing the drone from entering into a zone which is uh, restricted for any reason. Uh, you have example here of uh, such type of restriction and you see uh, the trajectory avoiding these uh, restricted zones. Uh, so the project was aiming at testing exhaustively the existing solutions. So the project gathered uh, drone manufacturers, uh, use space service suppliers, um, operators, and uh, the idea was to uh, show uh, what are the limitations of today's solution and what should be done to, to improve them. And by the same time, we elaborated a standard in EuroCAE Group 105. Uh, so now we have a MOPS uh, number, the ET269 that will go into open consultation and that is proposing a set of functional and performance requirements for the function and also a standard for delivering the data uh, to the US or the US operator. And for sure the next step should be to test and implement uh, this standard now to mature it so that in 2021 it could be used as a, as a solution. Thank you. So it's made very good progress by the sound of it in terms of moving towards a standard setting process. Yes, there is something now available for, for use. Thank you. Um, and next we have Bettina Knudsen, who is the uh, Chief Operations and Marketing Officer of Explicit, a drone operator. And Bettina, I know you've been heavily involved in the Sapphire project. Can you say a few words about that? Uh, yes, I will. We were part of the Sapphire, and I think Mark already on the um, previous panel sort of gave a short introduction to that. Sapphire was all about demonstrating multiple scenarios, operations at the same time, and manage them in a complex environment, which in our case was the port of Antwerp and the city of Antwerp. And we did that in, uh, I think, mid-September mid or, uh, you know, this year. Uh, where we had a whole host, as you can see, of, uh, of, of various parties and operators running various kinds of scenarios in parallel. Um, and as was touched upon on the other panel as well, had, I think, uh, some very good demonstrations on how you can, you know, uh, manage awareness and how you can manage airspace, uh, UTM, via V, ATM, and sort of, you know, uh, that whole uh, uh, risk case. Uh, from our point of view, um, we were one of the use cases in that uh, we monitor um, exhaust emissions from vessels as part of regulatory enforcement. So this was this was our case in that um, in that context. So very very exciting. Okay, thank you. And finally, we have Andreas Lamprecht from um, AirMap. Um, I know we have a couple of slides, Andreas, and, and you're, you've been involved in actually quite a few uh, CESAR projects. Do you want to say a few words about yes. where you've been involved? Do you want me to go to the second slide? Yeah, just skip ahead, yep. exactly. Um, it has been a bit of an insane year for us, and we're really looking forward to the holiday break. Um, maybe to start off, if you look at the, the left side of the map, there's actually a whole ton of activity in the United States that um, I think it would be good if there's more exchange in terms of learnings and, and lessons learned between the US and Europe. So my contribution to, <laughs> to this would be to just mention that those uh, things exist and, and they all publish also reports and they have their media activities as well. Uh, there's activities from uh, uh, at the state level uh, called Integration Partner Program by the White House uh, in the US, which uh, led into uh, developing of, for instance, concept of operations for state level UTM services, uh, some expedited um, approvals for BV loss waivers or, or even the air carrier operations that, that we've seen uh, approved this year by, uh, by Wing and, and Matronet and others. Um, we've been involved in um, three different uh, NASA and uh, FAA projects um, in the final technical capability level four that is around um, basically demonstrating that multiple service providers can coexist in the same airspace and share data in a completely decentralized fashion. Um, and then finally with the FAA's program of low altitude authorization and notification capability that allows uh, operators to gain instantaneous access to controlled airspace. That also is an, is an improving, ever improving program 
where new airports are added, um, the operating routes get stricter, new health endpoints, statistic endpoints are being added. Um, and I'm happy to say that um, a lot of the learnings that we generated over the year in the US, we were able to then bring to Europe. Um, we were part of four of the CESAR projects in, uh, in Spain, in Finland, Estland, in the Netherlands and in France, actually also together with Christian in France in the GeoSafe project. And we reused a lot of the APIs of the data formats, the way to exchange data between the different partners back and forth. So that, that, that's very good, you know, don't, don't do the double work of uh, yet another definition of what a flight plan looks like or how to exchange tracking information. Um, could be more, you know, if we had a better um, initial target architecture and a, a more constrained set of, uh, you know, what the architecture and the interfaces are in which the different players and partners would need to work together. I think a lot of the, we could be even further now in across Europe in defining what standards look like. And then finally, to, to conclude, where the real value I think happened last year was in, in standards bodies, in particular the, the ASTM International, where we now are close to having a published standard for remote ID and tracking that took learnings from all of those projects. It's a consensus-based standard where a large number of industry players from all over the world actually, not just the US, uh, including some regulators, um, got to vote on and decided, yes, that is the way in which we want to exchange uh, remote identification data. And it also becomes the underlying uh, foundation for how to do uh, this data exchange mechanism for the further use-based services like the confliction uh, as the next step. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to continue with the, the, the questions with the discussion with the panel, but if you have questions, as with the other panel, we have Slido available, so please uh, start sending in your questions. Um, I'm hoping to have time to address them at the end. Um, in a way, the, the way, the way we've dealt with use space research and demonstration activities in the CESAR program is very different from what we have traditionally done in CESAR, where we have the pipeline starting with exploratory research, then industrial research, and only after that do we move into demonstration activities. Here, we've been consciously trying to accelerate the whole process by running both exploratory research activities as well as demonstration projects. I'd be interested to know, um, I mean, most of you, apart from Andrew, you're from, you've been involved in the demonstration projects. Uh, Chorus is an exploratory research project. How do you assess the success of that in terms of um, delivering maturity? Um, how would you uh, score what we've achieved so far through these, these CESAR projects? Maybe Andrew first in terms of the concept and, and so forth. Uh, we, we got some very important feedback about the concept. Um, it would be nice to have some more. But one thing that we learned at the beginning of Chorus, that people were, uh, drone operators were sensitive about the confidentiality of their operations. Their um, inspection flight, people told us, if my competitor knows I'm inspecting that building, they can go to the owner of the building and, and, and bid against me. Subsequently, the demonstrations have shown that, that situational awareness is far more important than this kind of confidentiality, and uh, not hitting the other guy is more valuable than, than not having his, his business taken from him. So we've revised our thinking and the wording of the CONOPS in light of the experience of the, of the demonstrators. I'm looking forward to reading the reports from the demonstrators. They're not all in yet, but uh, I'm sure there'll be more learnings that we can take when they're available. And Thomas, I mean, what, what are the, in terms of not just how do you score maturity, but what would you say are the key lessons that have been learned through, through the demonstration project? Um, the key lessons that I've learned in the project is you need to be flexible. And um, some of this is, like I said, flexible but strong. And you need to communicate a lot. It's not only about the technical system, it's about collaboration between the stakeholders and, and the early engagement of stakeholders. And I think that the, approach of having both the exploratory research and the demonstrators next to each other really worked out well because you see each other, you talk, and you can exchange and you can learn. Um, we've changed some things, we did not change all the things, we learned over the trials, we followed the chorus workshops, and I think it's um, with some guidance, you find your base. 
concept of operations, interoperability, um, more focus on, on, on a specific service, focus on architecture, and I think that all the projects in the end come together. So very, very good approach to answer your question. Okay. Major lessons learned. Um, decoupling is essential, and a um, certain sense of uh, realistic approach is very important to make things happen. Um, it's been a tough schedule. It's been lots of things to, to integrate, and it took me a while to realize, and I was in the financial domain before, that the system of systems that we are looking here, that we're seeing here, is really huge, really complex, and complexity does not disappear, risk does not disappear. Um, things take time, and I think we've really pushed the limits this year. Let's see what next year brings. Question. Yes, I would say that the success of demonstrator uh, depends also on the context uh, when they begin. For example, uh, if you have no regulation or no standard uh, uh, at the beginning, it may be difficult to evaluate the results of the test you are doing. So uh, I think it's very important to, to have uh, some basis uh, and that you demonstrate a new test versus this, this reference. Uh, and specifically when we are speaking about security and safety functions. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but is that not a bit chicken and egg? You're saying you need the standards to be able to validate. I mean, you need to first uh, to do the research. We, we, the yes, we need research. We need to have principles. We need test to know also the limits and the tricky points that are not discovered by paper analysis. And then uh, when we have uh, something uh, such as a first draft of regulation, such a draft of standard, then we need to implement, strictly speaking, as, as written, and check if in this standard there are still missing points, uh, corner case which are not covered. And for sure, for typically I think for U1, we have the first set now of standard available, and we should uh, take care during next year to have some implementation projects that ensure the maturity of, the, of what is available now. And solve the last remaining corner case, probably. And we know some of them. And, and, and in the domain of geofencing, if I understand correctly, you, you have kind of the basic geofencing, the foundational element, but then you have more advanced levels, tactical geofencing or mm -hmm. dynamic geofencing. Where are we in, in, that, um, in that range? In, in fact, the, the standard covers both uh, tactical and dynamic geofencing. The question is how, how you, uh, you will use it now. So, uh, for example, uh, in the data model, do we have all the restrictions that are needed, all the conditions that are needed by the state? Do we have the right combination of restrictions? So uh, we should have state implementation to see if the restrictions we have defined by geographical zone are adequate. We have also scale factor to test how many number of uh, zones per state, how many number of users a day, how many updates a day, for example. Uh, and we know there are also some points which are more difficult and would need some research, uh, such as, for example, when you go to automatic limitation, which is beyond the current regulation. The current regulation calls only for an alert to the pilot. But if you want to go to automatic uh, limitation uh, of the UA, uh, then you can have corner cases which are not totally solved today. Mm -hmm. For example, what to do when uh, you are flying in a zone which, is, which was previously authorized and suddenly because of an emergency it becomes uh, restricted. So you should exit, but how, uh, in mat how many times do you have to exit? This has to be defined. Also, if we are speaking about uh, uh, dynamic and update. What is the uh, maximum time allowed uh, since the last update? Can I fly if my update is one hour uh, old or two hours old? Or should I have always five minute update? Mm. And also, but it's for longer term probably, uh, we discovered also a question about uh, uh, compatibility with the detect and avoid. When we will have detect and avoid, for example, what will be the priority between an alert of uh, geofencing and an alert of avoidance? Right. But this is, I think, for longer terms, uh, yes. not for okay. you. Bettina, lessons learned? Well, I think lesson learned from the Sapphire project is really the value of show over tell. 
over, you know, trial over assumption. Uh, there's, uh, there's an awful lot to be learned from running these demonstrations, you know, just being out there in real life and trying it out really it gives a lot of valuable input, you know, both in terms of, you know, technical advances, operational advances, regulatory frameworks, where just basically, you know, it's a whole different ballgame when you're out there actually doing it uh, for real. There's also actually a lot of comfort in, in demonstrating that it can be done and it is manageable. And, you know, there was talk about how, how do you sort of demystify some of this, make people, you know, comfortable, public comfortable about what's going on. Well, partly you do by showing that you can be comfortable around it. And I think Sapphire was very successful in demonstrating that. Did we have things that obviously we would go back and do differently? Obviously, that's the intent also of demonstrations to try and sort of flush that out. Um, but, 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 but overall, I'd say, you know, I think it's a, it's a great strength to actually have moved up the demonstration phase, you might say, of, of, uh, of the CSR projects. Because in that, you get a better iterative process, right, that can feed into both the regulatory work uh, you know, the technical work, you know, sort of the operational side of things, planning and what have you. Um, so that was a, a real valuable lesson, I think. Okay. And we did it. Yes. Yeah. And Andreas, what's your assessment? Um, and in, can I also ask you specifically about the Domus project? Because the Domus project was one specifically looking at multiple uh, uh, providers operating in the same airspace, if I understand correctly. How, what's the, the lessons learned from that project? Yeah, so I mean, to, to no one's surprise, basically all the SSR projects were working in a direction where there is multiple service providers that are in the end connected to operators. In, in Domos, I would say it, it was one of the projects where the level of centralization was probably the highest amongst all the SSR projects. Um, Golf and Vutura and, and others were more towards um, more de a decentralized fashion. Um, it, in order to really determine the learnings, it, it's a it's a bit tricky, I would say, because it depends what the the KPIs are, what what we actually wanted to achieve. And and just to say we wanted to prove that you can exchange data between service provider. Okay, give me a break. I mean, that's a bit, uh, that's not really the question. Of course you can exchange data. But maybe because we, we set those up as, as demonstration projects, we didn't really have any performance metrics to hit beforehand or anything to measure. And, and I also, you know, this comes with the issue that of course now <laughs> people generate reports and, and the question is, well, what do we put in those reports? So all of us are now filling out the spreadsheets with the TRL levels <coughs> per service and um, well, um, I, I would question the, uh, and I, I look forward to the, the next iteration of this uh, in terms of, you know, what, what is the target level of performance for exchanging flight plans or uh, remote identification data or tracking data. Um, for, for us, really the major learning, aside of course from putting a young organization as we are through the, through the hassle of doing 20 something projects in parallel and, and delivering on all of them, that's something we learned. Um, but compared to the US, the European environment really has this unique uh, difference of many different countries that have borders and different authorities that are responsible for and different levels of authorities that are involved. Because in the US, it's a really big country with just one air navigation service provider and one civil aviation authority, and, and that's pretty much it. So that level of complexity is is very interesting across Europe and, and we've seen across many different projects that software can help solve this complexity very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, some questions are coming in on Slido, so maybe we could put them up on, on the screen so people can see them. Please keep coming with questions, although we're going to be running out of time fairly soon. Before going to the Slido questions, though, the last panel uh, addressed a bit this, what seems to be a very hot topic about the integration or not of UTM, U-Space, and traditional ATM. And some of the projects uh, that Cesar has been running have been kind of really addressing that issue. How do you see that question? Um, is it feasible to have an integrated system? Do we have to go step by step with separation? Uh, what's your perspective on that based on what we've learned through the demonstration projects or through Chorus? Could I jump in? Yes. Please? When we started talking to people in um, uh, air sports, general aviation and so on, 
there was this uh, idea that nothing would change for them. And uh, we knew we couldn't provide that. So we wanted to create a situation where we could have a mature discussion where we would disappoint them. And uh, we haven't got there yet. But I think an integrated environment will require everybody to behave as if it's an integrated environment. And I think we have a bit of work to do. Yeah. Anybody else want to? Well, I don't want to go down the line. Anyone want to say a? Uh, I mean, Thomas, please. <laughs> we have a bit of work to do, I fully agree. Um, when I try to explain at home to my family what I'm doing, it's not an easy thing. Traveling a lot is the strange new things, and actually I'm doing planes, and actually I was doing IT. Um, they don't really understand, and then I try to compare. To me, it's like going up a mountain. I'm Austrian, so hiking is something we do a lot. I need to make sure I'm capable. I need to make sure I've got all the services that I need. Um, and then I need to do proper planning, not only of my trip, but of the whole framework around. Going up the mountain, I need to know if it's like a climb and there's a small rope, there can be only one going through in the sequence. If I don't plan properly, if I don't know who's up there, I can't safely execute my trip. So one of the things that I've seen in the demonstration, talking to operators, um, if they see everything on their ground control station, they're happy because that gives them a good feeling. They can better control what's going on. They have situation awareness. So in my opinion, it's definitely one airspace integration. Okay. Bettina? If I could make a point, I think, or two points actually. Um, you know, I think from, from the other panel as well, there's a great lesson in, 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 in what Mark said about market generally uh, responds better to, you know, what it is allowed to do than what is it not allowed to do, right? So, so there's, there's, there's more commercial value in, in what you're permitted to do than, than, than what you're prohibited from, from doing. In terms of the integration or the, the you know, the, a lot of that, I would actually argue, in practice comes naturally. There are not necessarily as many overlaps as we, as we can, you know, sort of, think on paper and I'll give you an example so the application that we do which is emission monitoring at sea right that that's a low level flight mission we're typically below 150 feet right above sea level we're far out over sea or in port areas and things like that and we fly this mission both manned and unmanned ask me how many times we have ever in the thousands of missions we've flown come across anything else in our airspace how many Seagulls, seagulls is mostly what we, obviously we're worried about the vessels because we're close to them, so the ground risk is actually something that's more interesting to us than what's going up up there. Um, and, and I would probably argue from a commercial point of view that there are loads of applications that actually have the same concern. That it's not so much about that, but it's about you know, what's going on down here and how we manage that. And so I think that's a, maybe a, a valid question here that's, Maybe a the ground risk is a little underappreciated in some of these discussions, right. maybe. Andreas? Yeah, if I can chime in here, I absolutely agree, and also comparing the activities in Europe with those in the US, um, one could realize that in the US, the, the problem of airspace integration has been, uh, or integration into manned airspace uh, ha has been solved with a, like an intermediate step, I would call it. So you, you do have now in all of the US a very easy way of getting access to controlled airspace under certain conditions, visual line of sight, you have to stay under a certain maximal flight altitude, can only be daytime operations, and a few more of those. But it works fabulous. It's, it's a system that gets you this authorization in a matter of seconds. Um, and you can even, if you need to fly outside of those conditions, request uh, what is called further coordination step, where then someone in the air traffic control tower basically assesses the, the risk of this operation. Now, you, you can't do complex beyond line of sight missions currently in this system, but the, the focus has been of enabling the industry to provide those services and lot large areas of the land, of course, are not in controlled airspace at all, so you don't need to necessarily coordinate with air traffic control or integrate into in, in any ATM system when you do a rooftop inspection 20 feet above the roof of a city where there is no airport nearby. 
And, and if you think this one step further in, in the, like how today do we have the airspace map? Where does the airspace map come from? It, it comes from where the airports are largely. Those are built next to cities because that's how the, what society needs to fly in and out of cities. Well, with drones and, and uh, as a next step, electrical uh, vertical mobility, you don't need those airports anymore. The whole city becomes the airport. So what does that mean? To, what does that do to our airspace? It probably looks completely different in the future. And so the, the, I agree, we should more focus on the aspect of what, what is the benefit that drones can bring to society and what are the actual risks that we need to resolve to unlock the next step. And I, and I believe this full integration into an airport environment for sure is a topic, but it, it's one of many and maybe not the most important to solve next year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, looking at the questions we've received, I'm going to deal very quickly with the one that's at the top of the list. Will Cesar publish a consolidated summary of the demonstration findings? Yes. Um, and that should be published. I don't want to commit to a specific date, but certainly a first half of next year and hopefully first quarter of next year we'll be publishing something. Um, I'm looking for a question that there's a very specific question about the ASTM standard and Bluetooth, the remote ID. Is anyone able to answer that question, Andreas? I, I think the actor one, one attempt of answering this. So the problem with Bluetooth is that most drones don't have this on board to transmit the information. Most drones have a Wi-Fi signal on board that is transmitted. So there's actually not a lot of drones able to do that. You can find a test report if you go on the Swiss CAA's website, FOCA, and you Google for uSpace. They did a test where those um, different mechanisms were compared and, and they published the report. Um, so that's available online. Okay, thank you. Um, th please tell me if there's a question there that you want to answer. Um, because they're covering, I mean, some of them I think are more of a regulatory nature. What kind of information services should be free of charge and what kind of information services should be monetized by use space service providers? I guess that's not something that the demonstration projects have. <laughs> well, we, we thought a little bit about it. Exactly. I mean, okay. obviously, it depends on who you are, right? I mean, I, you know, how, how you, you answer that question. But I think there's an underlying question which we have, you know, sort of spoke about on offline as well before we were here, uh, which is the whole cost aspect of it, right? I mean, we're talking about a technical maturity, operational maturity. We could also talk about commercial maturity, right? Yes. And, and that's, it's sort of a, it's a word that's been omitted, you know, through all these great discussions. It's like, what's it going to cost, right? Because at the end of the day, I think the, the real question through this, and it touches a little bit on some of the other questions and lessons learned from these demonstrations, is basically how can we protect commercial viability as we move through these phases, right? That's really the key because we can, you know, do a lot of demonstrations, think a lot of things, but if we lose market along the way, you know, then the whole ball game is sort of over. And, and I, from an operator point of view, I think that's, uh, or I would even say from an applicant client point of view, you know, that's the real key. There's just a, you know, there's a limit to how much we can also invest into actually getting access to this airspace before other options become available. And this is one thing that I, at least from an operator point of view, has always found a little weird. It's, it's, it's like this whole drone space is, is in its own bubble and not quite aware that it is up against disruptions in a lot of other industries, yes. a lot of other places. This is not the only way to you know, get the job done, basically. And if we're not aware in how we protect that commercial viability, keeping the cost aspect of all of this reasonable, we're losing the game mm -hmm. before we even get started. Yeah. And, and that's just very essential. Christian. Yes, I would like to react on uh, the third question on the screen, uh, or third comment about the identification. I think there is uh, often a confusion between, uh, between uh, direct remote identification, for example, Bluetooth or Wi-Fi, which is only a 500 meters or one kilometer range. So this one will not be usable for UTM or for traffic monitoring. So we need another solution uh, E-identification, yes, maybe the right name. Uh, this one will enable to transmit over a long distance up to uh, any traffic monitoring service. 
And of course, it's not possible, I think, for uh, UTM to deploy uh, a base station each and every kilometer uh, on the surface. So mm -hmm. do not confuse uh, direct remote identification, very short range, and e-identification for traffic monitoring, which is to be defined. Uh, and actually, the, the ASTM standard on remote identification has has three different ways of, of how to dissipate information. Two of those are direct over in 2.4 gigahertz spectrum, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And then the third one is over um, internet network, basically. Um, there's one question around what, what, what does it mean for drones that are not equipped? How do they participate? The standard actually doesn't prescribe that the drone itself is connected. It talks about the UAS. So most of the drones that we use for all sorts of purposes today have, are connected to a mobile phone which is connected. So you don't have to directly send from the drone. You can use your mobile phone to do that. And there's already existing solutions from many different service providers who, who fulfilled it, this uh, function. On top of that, there's also a version of the standard that is for, for truly non-equipped, like 20 euro model airplanes. And there you, you just basically submit your flight area of operation through a mobile phone application, according to the standard. And then you don't have live position data available, but at least you have sort of the area in which you're operating. So that is also covered in the standard. OK, thank you. I'm afraid we're running up against the, the time deadline. Um, there's a question about uh, whether Cesar is thinking of running further demonstration activities. We actually have uh, issued um, an exploratory research call, which is currently going through the evaluation process. So we're hoping, we'll have to wait and see if any uh, use space projects are chosen in that context. And I understand there will be one further uh, demonstration call, but what will be in, we have to see. Um, last question, and I want very short answers. What would be your priority topic for future work in future demonstrations? Just go down the line. So two or three words quickly. I'll start with Andreas, actually. I'd like to move from one-day demonstrators to year-round active projects so we can include more of society and different stakeholders, you know, schools, firefighters, the city mayor, uh, into benefiting more from what drones can bring in terms of benefits to society. Right. Tina? I'd like to see demonstrations in different risk classes, basically, uh, because the, the applications are different. I think it's one thing, and as I said, more focus on ground risk as well, how we might integrate that or handle that as well as part of the operations. Okay. Twofold for me. One would be a, a demonstration of maturity of U1 standards that we have no, now or quite. And second would be to tackle with uh, the next services meaning authorization, flight plan management, traffic monitoring, because of the VLOS, the BVLOS, sorry, BVLOS uh, need to have these services probably. Gain experience, fly, 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 in a safe way, in, in big areas that we had now, and focus on areas that might have been overlooked because they're not so commercially interesting, like contingency planning. Somewhat like Andreas, I think we should look at longer-term projects, not just one-day flights, but I would like a real focus on BV loss. I think that's going to be so important for commercial viability of different operations. And we're stuck in VLOS at the moment. Okay, thank you. So I think the, my conclusion from this is that um, clearly these projects have been of value. We've made progress. We've learned some lessons. We're nowhere near the end of the journey, and there's plenty of work still to be done. Um, thank you to the audience for giving us a few questions, and please join me in thanking the panelists for what I hope was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We're now moving back to, uh, moving on to our final panel of this session, and we're going to be looking at the challenges facing airspace integration. The leader for that panel will be EASA's Patrick Key. It'll take a moment or two just to change everybody over. Um, during that time, I just wanted to state again that we have this afternoon the technical workshops and some of the more technical questions that have come up over the last two days, we can also, of course, address in those workshops. Room details and information on those I'll be giving to you later after this panel. Um. 
good, af good afternoon. This is the, the last panel of, uh, of our conference, uh, but uh, certainly one of the most interesting panels. We have been talking about the, the U.S., uh, the ecosystem of the U.S. We have been talking about use space extensively this morning. Now we are going to take things from a slightly different perspective, which is the integration of U.S. into uh, the traditional airspace, I, I should say, and, and to talk about the challenges. But we will, I guess, also talk about uh, the uh, interface uh, between, uh, between um, um, U.S., sorry, U-space and uh, traditional ATM. And I have uh, with me an excellent panel which is going to participate to the discussions and I'm going to ask uh, my fellow panelists to join me here on the podium, starting with Tania Grobotek, uh, who is the Consul European Director, then Barry Koperberg, who is the founder and general manager of Wings for Aid, which has no relationship with Google Wings. Uh, ju just uh, no, but you, you will explain to us. You will explain to us. Eduardo Dominguez Puerta, uh, head of urban air mobility from Airbus. Eduardo, Philip Merlo from Eurocontrol, director of Directorate uh, for European Civil Military Aviation. Jay Merkel, that you have uh, already seen, US, FAA US Integration Office Director. Giancarlo Buono from IATA, uh, Director for Regional Affairs in Europe. And last but not least, Jens Lehmann from uh, IFATCA, the International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers Association, and you are a senior air traffic controller at Munich ACC. So, Maybe to, to start off, what, I, what I'm going to, to ask uh, each of the panelists is to share with us what they see as the major challenges for U.S. integration uh, into the traditional airspace. And I will, I will ask uh, Tanya to start. Thank you, Patrick. Um, what we see as a main challenge is that we continue providing the same level of the safety and uh, not jeopardize, and uh, how do we integrate? Now, for integration, we do not expect that it's going to happen, continue happening like now, uh, like conventional ATM, the service we're providing now. So high level of automation will be required. Now, how do we do this high level of automation? Uh, we can learn from UTM in the future, and uh, we have some good examples in NATS or DFS, uh, how they are learning from UTM and what can do in improving automation in ATM, as well as um, understanding that airspace is not uh, infinitive uh, resources. So we need to uh, make it best possible for us all to operate. Thank you. Thank you. Barry. What's your perspective on this? Well, thank you, thank you, Patrick. Um, indeed, there's no similarity to the Google Wings project. Um, I am from Wings for Aid, but uh, we do want to deliver packages, uh, not with a rope, but deliver 20 kg of aid supplies worldwide for humanitarian actors. Um, I know that Google also has very specific societal intent, so that we also have, and I'm here to, re to represent the platform for unmanned cargo aircraft, uh, including knowledge institutions. Uh, in one word, we. We want to help to build uh, use cases um, uh, because we want to really move from uh, the ruling of manned aviation, where we want to start, basically. This is the uh, above specific category of cargo drones. So forget about the zip lines and the DHLs and the Amazons. I mean, that's all fine. We are looking at the, at the specific category and higher. So we run into uh, SORA and specification anyway. And our point is that we, we want to start, we want to operate it as manned to begin with. But then seriously, we have a lot of sensors on board for our future business case. Um, so for detect and avoid reasons based on radar. And um, we would like to start as manned um, uh, aviation basically, steer it as manned as Airpass, but then move and, you, and share our data that we have start, on board. Start as manned with a pilot on board or without a pilot on board? Remotely piloted. But um, as, a, as a frame, basically you operate under, under manned aviation rules. 
because where we want to deliver packages is in the lower airspace. However, maybe we want to be a little bit higher in the airspace as well. So basically, you start with the manned aviation, and then we want to build the bridge in the coming years towards true the true capacity of unmanned and have the use cases for that. Okay, so, so just to fully understand, you will have the pilots on the ground who will discuss with Jens and his colleagues that will not be sitting in the airplane. That's, that's your approach. Correct. Okay, very good. We'll have interesting discussions on this. Eduardo, what's your take on this? Um, I mean, Airbus uh, is, is really interested in, in the increase of, of traffic. Uh, I think uh, systems that support that uh, are, are definitely key to us. Uh, but I believe uh, we're in a very interesting uh, moment in history. We have U.S. space, uh, we have new needs at uh, low altitude airspace. We have at the same time a big trend in the world on digitalization and new technologies. And uh, I think the question is, uh, how can the classical ATM also leverage this new set of technologies to increase uh, efficiency and actually effectiveness? And I think uh, we shouldn't be debating about uh, should it be integrated or not. The question is how. And that poses uh, several problems and, and questions to be solved. Articulation of roles and responsibilities along that chain and positioning on the value chain. Roles and responsibilities uh, within national, uh, I would say, levels versus more integrated levels. And I think at some stage that poses a change uh, management uh, problem that includes even, uh, I would say, uh, the human beings and, and society as, uh, at large, but also social uh, employment. I think the reflection is, is really deep. So for us, as, as uh, you know, uh, also as an OEM moving into autonomy, uh, which is a big trend, there is also an integration to, to ATM, UTM. So I think it's very, very interesting. And I think most of the actors that we're here, we will need to think together uh, how that should work. Okay. So we need to think together. Philippe, how do we think together? Yes, uh, first, uh, first I would like to say that the full integration of, of a drone into uh, the same airspace as man aviation is the final objective. I believe we have uh, made a lot, uh, a lot of progress in, in the recent years uh, on that, and I'm referring to all the, the CESAR experimentation that were mentioned at, at the previous uh, panel. Now we have... Um, uh, common concept of operation uh, with a with a chorus uh, concept of operation. We also have accumulated a lot of uh, experience with all these uh, uh, projects. We have uh, the experience, for example, of an airspace assessment uh, in in Riga that was really uh, interesting. And, and so, but the good news is that today we are in the real life. And we have a much better understanding of the challenges that uh, we still need to, to overcome. And of course, the bad news is that these uh, challenges are, are very significant, very, very difficult. And uh, let me mention only two, uh, two points, but, but relating to the foundation of, of <coughs> drone integration. First point, we need a good communication link because everybody is talking about automation that without a good communication link, without a good data link, nothing can, uh, can work. We don't have it, it today, uh, this uh, communication link. Second point, we need a good tracking system and uh, we don't have it today. This is a conspicuity issue that was mentioned uh, before. We have a lot of prototypes for new mini transponders, but we have to select the, 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 the good one, the, the right technology. Uh, so these are only two examples, but uh, I have many more. For example, we still need to define a common altitude uh, reference, uh, we, which is basic. Cybersecurity is also a, a topical issue. Uh, so we realize that we still have a huge amount of research and uh, development uh, ahead of us. And, and for me, a priority is to define how we can structure uh, this uh, research and development in order to be, uh, to be efficient. Three points. I think we need to cooperate. We need a, a European team. 
to progress uh, with this uh, research and development. Second point, we need to focus. We need to focus on very specific use case. When once we have defined a, a use case, we need to fully investigate it and develop it to full maturity, meaning including the safety case, including the, the airspace uh, uh, assessment. And third and last point, we need to prioritize. And here I believe that for prioritization, we should rely on the business case. We know that we have use cases that are more interesting financially uh, than the others. Let's start with this positive cost-benefit uh, use case. And, and then once we have solved one use case, let's grow from that, let's extend it. So that's my okay. paper. Thank you. Jay, no challenges. EFA has the solution. <laughs> Tell us about it. Oh, wouldn't that be nice if we knew all the answers? But we're just like you. And I think the first challenge to in true integration, as, as I think we're all dedicated to, is ensuring that we have harmonized regulations around the world. And that's really the main purpose of why I've been here this week, is to really work towards that at all levels from the EC through EASA and then with the member states. But what exactly are we standardizing? In the U.S., I think we are uh, not only committed to the, the integration, but we've made some philosophical decisions and um, policy decisions. So 400 feet and below in uncontrolled airspace and up to 400 feet in controlled airspace, our ANSP has decided they do not want to provide services to these aircraft. So to Tanya's point, that means we must have a highly automated system so what are the high-level characteristics of that system? We believe the only economically scalable and safe way to do that is through a um, distributed system that relies on information sharing and 100% interoperability, which of course underlyingly relies on um, the industry standards. So that gets us that lower left-hand side of the curve. Now if I go to the upper right-hand side of the curve in the UAM, we fully believe that those aircraft are going to operate like IFR aircraft. And that's pretty straightforward as well. So for us, the challenge is that middle ground, those edge cases where it's not very easy to tell, is it completely UTM or is it completely ATM? And to us, those are the major challenge areas. We also have some challenges in cybersecurity. If you've been following the press, you know that drones are scary and drones from certain parts of the world are even scarier. And I think that presents us with a certain supply chain issue that we have to deal with. But it's really that middle ground in establishing what are the best ways to integrate safely and securely. Giancarlo, you told me that you didn't want to share your airspace with uh, UAVs or UAS. Can you elaborate yes, on we, this? Yes, we are fine, thanks. No. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think that most of the things have been said, uh, but I'd like to focus on a couple of points. So first of all, I think we all agree safety. But you know, safety is sometimes is used as a, as a slogan. It's not really used as a, as a, real, uh, a real issue. So what about safety? Safety, of course, is not about maintaining the same level of safety. It's about even increasing the level of safety, because that's what we are aiming in the industry. Uh, the question is, where we should we focusing? I mean, it's obvious we all understand the issue of uh, possible mid-air collisions, but where we should be focusing, in my opinion, is not only on that, it's also mainly on the interfaces between UTM and ATM, and also on the contingencies procedures. Uh, we tend to assume that everything goes as planned and that we can be very predictable. This is not always the case. Um, I was joking with my colleagues before, and, and, and I was thinking, imagine if uh, Captain uh, Sully, when he had to crash land on the Hudson, on top of everything that happened, he also had to avoid drones on his way into the Hudson River. So uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is about uh, capacity. I, I, I know that you have safeguards in place, but I'm just saying imagine if. Uh, the second issue is capacity. This was mentioned. Uh, airspace is a finite resources. Uh, resource is not only the, the finite, is not the only uh, problematic resource that we have. Another problematic resource that we have is the radio spectrum. 
I think nobody has mentioned that, but we compete on radiant spectrum with a lot of other industries. And in Europe, we're not been very good in having our data link working, as you all know. Uh, we've also not been very good at managing airspace capacity. Uh, we get into a crisis anytime there is a marginal increase in our traffic in summertime. Imagine if we add the numbers that we heard this morning in terms of hundreds of thousands of drones and how can we manage this capacity. And the third issue, which is uh, really in my heart, is who's going to pay for all of this? We also heard this morning uh, uh, some colleagues mentioning, well, of course, we assume this is going to be free for us, but unfortunately, there's nothing like a free lunch. Uh, somebody has to pay for it, and um, the risk is that the existing or the incumbent will pay for it, which is, in my opinion, not how it should be. If I'm going to the restaurant tonight, I'm not expecting to pay the dinner for the customers of tomorrow. Uh, so having said this, I think that what we need is really a different approach. If we try to continue to do things like we always did with the same technology that we always use, I don't think we're going to be successful. I think we need to look outside of the box, look at the new technology that is available, off-the-shelf technology at lower cost and more efficiencies. Thank you. Jens, are you ready to control drones in Munich? Uh, yeah, this is a very interesting question. I personally am not, <laughs> but it, it depends on where they fly, how high they fly, how good they are, and so on. But uh, in order to get uh, back to the basic question about the challenges, um, I'm here today on behalf of the air traffic controllers of the International Federation of Air Traffic Controllers, which is a worldwide organization that represents more than 50,000 controllers in over 130 countries. For us, safety is not just a slogan because we guarantee safety every single day. It is not any way there. We are the ones who ultimately guarantee that nothing happens, that the public can fly safely. That's why we are there. So IFATCA promotes not only safety, but also efficiency and regularity in the international air navigation. And therefore, any future UTM or U-space system must ensure a safe operation at all times. As the concept of UTM or U-Space continues to mature, systems providing already now initial levels of cap capability starting emerging, and the demand for airspace access continues to grow. It is important to answer specific organizational and procedural challenges that must be resolved to realize a harmonized, safe, and effective U-Space system implementation. It is important to say, I think, that U-Space activities wherever they're going to be, will be performed in airspace. So we deal with aircraft by definition. We are not dealing about flying trucks from A to B, it's aircraft. And this implies all the consequent problems and procedures that have to be taken into consideration. And at the current stage of the technological development and maturity with regard to potential users of airspace, of view space, the only solution so far, for use space is to be segregated from ICAO airspace. We as a FATCA propose therefore a phased approach. It has to start with segregation, then accommodation, and only finally integration into the airspace. For a FATCA, the safe, secure, and sustainable integration ultimately of unmanned aircraft or drones into the airspace is one of the crucial issues that modern aviation industry faces today. And to maintain the same level of safety, at least, if not more, separation must be guaranteed under all circumstances. And this applies also to the small drones up to a 25 kilo open category for us. Aviation is by nature international, and the current safety records have been achieved thanks to the continuous effort to harmonize at the global and regional level safety of the traveling public as well as the overflown citizens. Thank you very much. I, I think uh, all those um, presentations and, and statements uh, set the scene for the discussion. And um, I think th there is one, one of the, the topics uh, which were, were mentioned was, and I, I think it's quite a fundamental question. Um, it is in order to, in, to have uh, UAS flying into the ATC airspace, to, to put it very simply. There are two possibilities. Either we ask the UAS to comply 
with the current rules of year, basically, or we change the rules of year. What should we do? Barry. I think that um, <clears throat> I want to connect that there is a, a very strong legacy of the management and, and, and the guardianship of the, of the airspace uh, at present, with uh, humans in the loop that we all very much appreciate. So I think that has a priority over everything. However, in the long run, the segregation will not hold. Um, there I would disagree. Uh, I think we will work towards integration. Um, so I think that we start with the, the procedures now. That's why I want to connect with the remotely piloted systems for the larger drones, uh, for cargo drones, and then build use cases. I tend to disagree also on the business case of things. I think it wouldn't make sense. Uh, that is why we disagree with Google. Always when Google takes an initiative, there is a commercial drive. And I think that if we want to test drive into operability, it would be much smarter to go for uh, first Im improve safety. Does it mark? Um, does it um, uh, have social impact? Because that enhances the public acceptance. Because in future, we will, as a, um, uh, as a society, will need to deal with extra risk. If you want to go down with your medical helicopter and there are drones around, it might take more time to go down than you have now. So the social impact of it, and then does it build trust amongst the actors? Is everybody involved? I would propose that as a criterion to test drive interoperability and use cases instead of looking at business cases. I think this is a discussion beyond a business mm -hmm. case. And that is why we find, but that's Wings for Aid point of view, to work with humanitarian actors first and make it work there first. That would be my comment. Mm -hmm. Tanya, your, your point on this. Uh, is yeah. is the, the current system able to integrate UAS? Simple, no. 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 Current system, no. But what is the key that, well, rules of the A are probably older than me, and I'm not that young. So uh, we no need to evolve. When, when we come with the rules of the A, there was no such things as a drones, and they behave and they fly completely differently than conventional aviation. So we need to involve. Can we do that overnight? Uh, no, it's not going to happen. I think we need to be very realistic. So the question is a step approach. And that's why I think that NSPs are in quite good position, maybe in collaboration with some of existing providers to uh, provide this kind of services. Because we can learn from them, but they can also learn from us what is, the, how do you need to behave if you're in controlled airspace? Or whatever the, this future new airspace is going to be. But, but if, if we take Barry's, uh, you know, you have your beautiful airplane, which is, uh, which is here uh, on display. And basically, this can be a manned or unmanned airplane. So basically, you know, um, whether it's manned or unmanned, uh, it should be transparent to controllers. Huh? So, and, and Jens, you know, do, would you be able to control Barry's airplanes uh, regardless of whether there is a pilot on board or not, if the, be the behavior is the same as a normal airplane, uh, there will be a remote sleep, a remote pilot on the ground. So why wouldn't you be able, it's purely psychological, no? Would you be able to control his airplanes? Yes. Thank you. It is that okay. simple. It Done. depends basically, <laughs> it depends basically on how they operate. That's what I said before, it depends how high they fly and how they react for us. Whether a pilot on board or not shall be irresponsible, it shall be not important for the purposes of air traffic control. As long as the drone acts like a plane, flies like a plane, and the pilot acts like a normal pilot, we do not really care. On the other hand, just to want us to add on what uh, Tanya just said, we have sectors in Germany, we have 100 aircraft an hour in one sector controlled by one person. This is done by, yes, ancient VHF, but also by CPDLC nowadays. With this amount of traffic, you cannot handle drones Agreed. currently at Agreed. the current stage but of technology. And you cannot so handle much. general aviation either and so on. So. Yeah. By the way, I'm a general aviation pilot and I'm pretty sure that a remotely piloted uh, aircraft would be much better than me piloting my own aircraft. So that's, uh, uh, that's, that's something that could be done. Philip, you wanted to say something? Y yes, I, I wanted to differ a bit with uh, what has just been said. Today, even if we take um, a certified uh, drone, a big one, a military one, almost like a, a normal uh, uh, commercial aircraft, very well equipped, 
uh, with a pilot on the ground and uh, a communication link, we still have two major issues that are not yet solved. The first one, they are well known. Huh? Uh, the first one is the communication link, the C2 link, for which uh, the, the, the reliability still has to be uh, demonstrated. And, and the second one is, of course, the detect and avoid uh, uh, fun function technology, uh, for which, of course, you, as you have no pilot in the aircraft, you have to, to develop a new uh, detect and avoid uh, uh, system. This is achievable huh? the, the, because you have a controller, you have a, a pilot, the, both of them are professional, so I understand that for, for the controller it's almost the same. But the safety case, if you want to fully demonstrate it, you need to solve these two issues, the C2 link and the detect and avoid. And nobody has done it yet, so it's still ahead of us. Huh? Jay, Jay, in the US, there are already a lot of military drones flying in, in the civil airspace. Correct. And, and they operate, as many have said, uh, the pilot interacts with air traffic control, uh, two-way conversation, taking instructions. The aircraft follows a prescribed flight plan. Um, they use surveillance like typical aircraft. And so I think it's very doable. In fact, we have multiple aircraft in certification right now. Everything from below uh, 55 pounds up to transport class aircraft, either as no pilot, pilot optional, or safety pilot. So we, that is not tomorrow, that is today, and it's more of it. But I'd like to return to this question of do we need a new set of rules? because um, I, th I think we are in fact backing into a new set of rules under USPACE or UTM. But I think sometimes people presume those rules are more like IFR, where there's active controller involvement versus VFR in uncontrolled airspace, where it's more the responsibility of the pilot. And what we see in the technology is the activities that one time were done by a controller or by the pilot are increasingly done by the aircraft. And so we're, we're seeing traditional aviation being completely rearranged. And those interfaces that we relied on in, um, in manned aviation, the traditional rules of the road, the, those roles and responsibilities for those activities are shifting around. And I think that's what we need to be very sensitive to in developing these new sets of rules. And Patrick, to make you feel better, my airmanship skills are so bad that I should only be responsible for an autonomous aircraft. <laughs> we can compete on that, I yeah. can guarantee Okay. <laughs> Giancarlo, did it ever happen to you in your uh, pilot career to be on the frequency uh, uh, with a controller at the same time as a drone pilot? Um, no, because I left the military too early, I guess, and not in civil life. Uh, in my opinion, the problem is, it's not about, do we need new rules? For sure the rules will need to evolve, uh, because we are into a different world. Uh, but we need the same rules, that's important. We all need to work on the same rules. We need some form of standardization, we cannot think of of, of working with different rules. Now, I like very much what my colleague from the FAA has said, because I am a bit tired to go to conference and hear that my job is not needed anymore. We are going with drones and we don't need pilots anymore. And we never hear that we don't need air traffic controllers anymore, sorry. <laughs> and that's not what, try to understand what, I, what I'm saying. Uh, I think that the system needs also to change. We have the technology to automate more. We have the technology to manage airspace also in a different way. Of course, we will need our traffic controllers and because they are fundamental to the system, but there are things that can be done in a different way, and we do have the technology to do them in a different way. And indeed, uh, to, to, to come back to what Jay was saying, the technologies on board, the aircraft manned or unmanned, have changed, and therefore we, we can adapt the rules of the air and, and the, the paradigm in order to increase the level of safety and taking into account these new capabilities. Eduardo, you want, you want to, to say something on this? I just, uh, you know, I was thinking of an example, uh, good autonomous cars need traffic lights. 
you know, is somebody that needs, uh, you know, I think the rules need to evolve as uh, technology evolves. And uh, yesterday we were talking about how long does it take uh, to evolve uh, regulations. And, uh, you know, you cannot do it continuously. You need to batch, uh, etc. I believe uh, the, there has been a, a clear step forward and they are new to come. But I, I think there's enough uh, technology development uh, to, to really have uh, that need to, to evolve the rules. No? And at the same time, there are new uses uh, that, that need to, to create the new regulations. So I, be, I believe uh, that yes, the, the rules uh, need to evolve, uh, but progressively. Uh, uh, that's really important to step by step. Daniel. Oh, well, I see Philip here from European Commission. <laughs> Uh, the social dimension is extremely important and I know that the European Commission is now working on a roadmap for digitalization. It's a not slow process to take. But your opening question was what are the challenges? I see this as opportunity because uh, with automatization, it's very difficult these days to attract uh, new air traffic controllers because the job is not attractive to younger generations. So with automatization and what is going to become, it's going to be opportunity for us to attract more um, newer generation with maybe different set skills. Yes, please. I fully agree on the, um, uh, on the communication links and the uh, detect and avoid. Um, for the communication links, we, we see a lot in, in, the, um, uh, in, the, in the satellite connection also the low orbit satellite connections worldwide, so that we standardize and can hook up to that. Um, but then in combination also with the 5G networks, so that you organize a little bit of redundancy or full redundancy when needed, so that you reason back from the decent systems that the military forces now operate, and that we start from that perspective. But uh, on top of that, we do have a lot of data on board radar based, and I think that will be increase. If we now see the cost price of the radar that we develop, to look around for future detect and avoid, I would like to be your eyes in the sky. Only if we as operators are become so many, it will be impossible for you to process the data. So how to connect to the air traffic controllers or future versions of you, and how to feed you with data that we can be part of your eye in the sky without overloading you with information that you cannot deal with. And that interaction I would find crucial in the use cases to build. Okay, Jens, j just um, uh, to, to, to make it clear, everybody is saying here that uh, today we can do a certain number of things. I would like to, for you to, to tell us what, in your view, are the prerequisites for the safe integration of drones into the current airspace. What, what in your professional opinion, are the requirements communication, surveillance, whatever, what are the requirements with which you would feel comfortable? This is quite a complex question, but um, there are several aspects in this, I think, for the integration into our traffic today. It needs, we spoke about this already, the problem is that drones cannot fly VFR, so there's no one outside to see, to see someone, to avoid someone. So we need initially detect and avoid or sense and avoid. We spoke about that. Um, all what is needed comes down to the problem who is responsible, who is held liable if something goes wrong. And for the time being, drones at the current state of the art, what, what, what we know, they are not yet ready for flying in controlled airspace, in non-segregated airspace. And that is the, the main problem. So if their sense of void is solved, if the communication issue is solved, as long as they are sticking to ICAO requirements in full compliance with ICAO re with the requirements, we should have not a problem in controlling them as long, as I said before, they act like planes and they communicate like planes and I can control them like planes. Communicating like planes, that means speaking like over the VHF radio. Or CPDLC or any other means of moving yes. means. I don't know what there is uh, possible. I don't think a drone can speak uh, no, no, over the radio. but. Uh, no, that is true. But <laughs> so we need or you, to you have a synthetic voices. Uh, <laughs> but, uh. As long as the uh, intention of a drone is clear, it's a different story too. Okay. On the other hand, I can't see that we constantly avoid our traffic just in quotation marks yeah. to have a drone fly somewhere where it wants. Yes. 
Eduardo can, and I will give you the floor, Philip. Eduardo, can you deliver what uh, Jens is asking for? I don't know. I mean, I yes. think uh, technology-wise, <laughs> yes there's no? a lot yes. that can be delivered. And, uh, you know, the, uh, some example to that and to what you were saying on communication is uh, today we have developed digital platforms to retrieve uh, all flight data from the existing airplanes. That's a, a lot of data. And those data need to be processed. And actually, they need to be taken into account. I believe uh, technology can deliver, yeah. Okay, so it's a yes. Yeah. All right, Philippe. Yes, um, I was struck by, by uh, the last uh, Jay's uh, intervention when he told us that in, in the US, drones were already flying in, in controlled airspace as, as kind of routine operation. So obviously in Europe, we are late compared to the, that's my conclusion. I think that would be very interesting to understand why we are late in Europe. What because we are Europe. No, no, no. <laughs> Too easy. What is missing in Europe that is already existing in the US and, and that has enabled the US to move uh, faster? And I have a suggestion. Huh? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of it, but I know that in the US they have developed a program approach. They, they have a, a full team dedicated to move the drone operation forward uh, full time. And, and today, this is uh, an old uh, Eurocontrol idea, you know that, but this kind of program team doesn't exist in Europe, and this is what we should develop. It does, I'm sorry, it does. Huh? Uh, I will show you the program team later on. <coughs> and I would like to say, I, I wish we would not characterize either the US or Europe being ahead of the other. I, I, I do not think... Uh, while we have certain operations that we're doing that you're not doing, I, I think it sometimes feeds the wrong narrative. It feeds a competitive narrative. And I think we are both sides working very hard to support each other to get to this integration goal. I know that's not how you meant it, but I, you know, every once in a while there's a reporter in the audience and they like to pick up on those things. No, but no, I, no competition. We cooperate very well with the FAA. And but, but uh, I believe we should catch up with you. No, oh, I, I agree with Jay. Uh, I, I agree with Jay. I, I think it's a, it's a question of, you know, we have different approaches. The, the, the US one single service provider, ATC service provider. Like one CAA, one single yes, service supplier one single under provider. one person. You don't have to agree with another 27 states. Yes. No, no, no. no. We, you different. know, we're multiple siblings, but we have one parent. And, and, and you know, um, I was interviewed like you by journalists who were trying to say exactly what Philip said, you know, the, the US are ahead of Europe or Europe is ahead of... It, it's not this way because, you know, we have a legislation that you don't have, you have other legislation. It cannot be compared like this. It's too simplistic. I so I, I, I think, you know, what matters is that we share information because at the end of the day, uh, the way in which we control a drone in our airspace has to be the same way as you control a drone in your airspace. It has to be compatible. That's what uh, Jens was saying, following the ICAO uh, regulations. Um, not requesting changes to the ICAO regulations because it's going to take 10 years. Huh? So, so if we can just uh, follow the current uh, regulations, that's, that's much easier. Uh, Giancarlo, you wanted to say something? No, yes, that, I mean, th this are, in fact highlights one of the problems that we do have in Europe, which is we need to ensure that we're having a, a, a coherent approach across the board. I mean, we don't want, certainly want fragmentation. You already mentioned that, and this is very important for us, that we need to have a global approach, but we also need to make sure that we have a European approach because we've been seeing uh, initiative at the national levels that, in my opinion, should be uh, completely avoided, and, and we should leave the European institutions and the European agency to work uh, together with the states, of course, to find uh, common European solutions for the issue of integrations of drones. Otherwise, this is just not going to be manageable. Mm. I don't know how much more time do we have. Janet? We have about 15 minutes, I think. It was just coming fast. We still have 15 minutes? Sorry, you're supposed to finish at 12.50. So we have uh, 10 more minutes. 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. So there, there are a number of questions on, on Slido, and uh, uh, there is... Uh, one which I, I found quite interesting, which was, it is, it's disappeared now, but it was saying, 
we are all talking about sense and avoid, but uh, it seems there are technologies which do exist today. So why don't we just implement those technologies? Eduardo. Um, I think uh, there's an element of uh, certification of uh, new technologies and, and non-deterministic systems, machine learning. I mean, first of all, what are the means of compliance to certify those systems? I think that is a question that needs to be solved at, uh, at vehicle level. Uh, but once you have done that, and I'm sure that can be done, how do you integrate that into the rest of the system? Mm. So I think uh, technology maturation is there. We also need to evolve uh, and create the regulations and, and the certification elements that support that. And until that is done, that will be difficult to introduce that into the overall system. So that is, uh, that is for me, a, a key thing. When I look at our demonstrators today, and when you look at the, the different autonomy elements and systems that are being developed, uh, they fulfill the functions. Are we able to certify? That's the question. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah. There was one very interesting question which disappeared as well. I don't know how, how it works on Slido, but the, it was for you, Jay. How do you make sure that under 400 feet, um, you know, there is traffic, like emergency vehicles and things like that? How do you make sure, who is making sure that there are no collisions and that everything is going smoothly? So for uncontrolled airspace, um, the Part 107 rule sets out rules of the road. So uh, unmanned aircraft in visual line of sight must um, avoid manned aircraft. Okay. Uh, it is, in fact, a challenge for beyond visual line of sight. But anytime we approve a waiver, or in the case of a Part 135 exemption uh, for beyond visual line of sight at those altitudes, we have additional safety measures. Some of them are procedural and quite clever, like if you're um, operating over a power line, doing power line inspection, if you are within a certain distance of the power line, we assume uh, um, a manned aircraft in that same proximity, it's on its way to an accident, mm -hmm. and so, you know, the drone should not be a problem. It was a bit of a joke, sorry. Mm. Um, of course. But no, we use our, the, the short answer is we have our usual safety processes and we use several different uh, risk mitigators, mm -hmm. everything from visual observers and we are seeing the, the dawn of detect and avoid and see and avoid technology, mm -hmm. so we're seeing that. Mm -hmm. um, we have several opportunities. Okay. There is this question, this question we, we discussed about US and, uh, and Europe. How about other countries and other regions of the world? Do you have a clue on this, Tanya? Actually, I um, volunteer from my uh, previous job. I was in different region. Actually, I see this as benefit because if you don't have already infrastructure in the place, you can skip the technology. And in some aspects, you can be far more advanced and automized because there is nothing else to replace. In Africa, for instance. Yes, this is what I used to cover, Africa and Middle East. Yes. That's your approach as well, Barry. It, it is, and um, um, that is, was my point on the business case. Everybody leans towards populated areas because that is where the business is. Well, uh, for ground risk, that is very unfavorable. Um, so uh, unpopulated areas, for instance in Africa, but also islands in Indonesia, what have you, where humanitarian actors are, that can be the fantastic use cases to build the trust and help to feed data into the air traffic controllers and use that. So we would like to start um, in other regions primarily. And obviously everybody asks, will Wings for Aid operate in Germany as well? Well, not over cities in the coming five years, no way. Uh, because we are developing it for for, for global impact, and it will not be tuned uh, for to fly over German cities. It will be strict corridors, So, and that will be in other regions predominantly. But then again, if we work together with the United Nations, uh, present here as well, to see how we can work with their aviation standards in other regions, we think it is a great opening to keep the safety and then build slowly, slowly from there. Hence my point, start with manned thinking and just build the bridge together to from unmanned to manned. Yes, this is, if at, if at is an international federation, is it something which is tackled at uh, an international uh, level or is it really European and, and US? No, as an international organization, we really take care every year with our conferences that we do cover the entire world. And our policies are pretty clear on this and this basically applies for all countries that are members in IFATCA. So we do have working papers on this literally every year. We develop our statements further and uh, I think we can 
we can say that what we propose here and what we are standing for is a global scale. Very good. There was a question on, on, uh, on, on security as well. Are we doing enough on security? What do you think, Philippe? Uh, I think on, on security, the key issue is cyber security because, of course, uh, a drone, especially a big drone, can become a, a weapon for malevolent people that uh, could take control of it. And yes, we are working on, on the cyber security techniques uh, to, to secure, to avoid uh, such uh, hacking. But here again, the, the, the issue is more with the communication link. Once you, once you have a good data link with a good uh, bandwidth, the cyber security is easy. The technology already exists on the ground. What is missing today is the good data link. So a lot of infrastructure, basic work to be, to be developed. Yeah. Very good. I believe we, 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 we are about... Uh, uh, yes, we need to move on. That's what uh, Janet is uh, telling me through science. Uh, what I would like to propose to you is that uh, um, you give us in three words what you think the audience here needs to take away from our discussion. Uh, in three words, you give us what is important for you. Three words, Giancarlo. Huh? I've done that exercise with you I can already. Two. Okay. I start with you, Giancarlo. Two words. I'm very good today. Think differently. Think differently. All right. Nice. <laughs> this is what he uses in each and every conference. <laughs> Philippe. Cooperate, focus, and prioritize. Okay. Jay. Harmonize, evolve. Good. Tanya. Safety, collaboration, integration. Very good. Jens. Think safety. Barry. I would say um, build trust and radar. Okay. Eduardo. Just, just do it. Just. <laughs> <laughs> Give the floor back to Janet. <laughs> okay. So thank you very much on that note. Thank you very much to all of our panelists. As you're all aware, we have a new EU Commission in place, and we're now very lucky to have somebody here to give us a little glimpse of what the future UAS policy in Europe could be. I'd like to welcome back from DG Move, Philip Cornelis. conference is, is coming to an end um, and in fact also with it uh, the first cycle the first European cycle of drone work and drone policy is coming to an end and this cycle started five years ago and I know many of you were with us already at the time when uh, we all together uh, saw I think the potential of drones as a tool to foster a digitalization and even decarbonization uh, in our society and economy and uh, uh, then made it one of our main uh, policy pillars. And I, I must pay tribute also to my previous commissioner, Violeta Bulls, for uh, pushing us all those years to produce uh, concrete results. And I think we did. Of course, we are not at the end uh, of this road. Uh, and uh, in the meantime, it's clear that our actions on drones and digitalization are, are part now of a much wider policy context. Let's remember that drones uh, and new space are in reality about digitalization and automation. We are talking about flying platforms that will provide uh, innovative services in an automated way. So we are part of a much wider evolution of our society towards a digital economy. And this digital economy is precisely one of the headline uh, political ambitions of the, the new commission, the von der Leyen Commission, uh, that started uh, this week, actually. Uh, and it is our ambition to facilitate this evolution towards a, a digital economy. Secondly, I want to say uh, at the outset, if we want to be relevant for our citizens uh, in Europe and beyond and for our businesses, 
we have to focus on the drone service, not so much on the drone operation as such. And that's why uh, our actions should always concentrate on the actual market potential for drone services uh, and the impact uh, on market opening. It's our task to remove barriers, not create or perpetuate them, uh, whilst, of course, always safeguarding the highest safety levels, as we were also reminded in the panel we had just now. Thirdly, I meant to mention up front that drone operations are also a vector for decarbonization, for decarbonizing our logistical chains and certain specialty air operations, at least if we also produce electricity in a sustainable way, of course. So these three principles, automation, digitalization, services for the citizen and decarbonization have been the foundations for the four declarations that we adopted in previous years, starting in Riga uh, four or five years ago, and then Warsaw, Helsinki, and Amsterdam. And these three principles were also the inspiration for the concrete regulations and actions that we have been discussing uh, during the last two days, and some have already been adopted, others are uh, in progress. And I want to thank also specifically EASA for the results achieved in uh, the previous years. EASA's leadership and expertise has been really instrumental in turning the ideas into robust and coherent rules. This much is clear, a lot has been achieved, but a lot is still really to be done to open the drone services market. And the further work will be performed under the new commission of President Ursula von der Leyen. We will embark on this new policy cycle where we will pursue and deepen the digitalization and decarbonization agenda also for transport and mobility, and now under the leadership of Commissioner Adina Valian. Under the heading, a union that strives for more, the new commission wants to ensure that Europe leads the transition to a healthy planet and a new digital world by bringing people together and upgrading our unique social market economy to fit today's new ambitions. One of the main ambitions of the commission will be to bring forward a European Green Deal that the Commission will propose uh, in uh, the next days, actually next week. The greening will go hand in hand with the digitalization of our economies and our transport change, chains. A Europe fit for the digital age is another of the headline ambitions of the von der Leyen Commission. Digitalization is the enabler for automating transport and that is really disrupting also traditional aviation. So be sure, decarbonization of transport, zero pollution, reduction in noise pollution, connected and automated mobility will all be high on the political agenda, including for our aviation community. So it looks like we will have a good political tailwind for our further work together on drones. Ladies and gentlemen, this does not mean all will be easy. Drones must still conquer many hearts and heads of the public. And they can only do so if they are safe, secure, green, and respectful of privacy. Indeed, we not only have to think in terms of safety, security, privacy, and the environment are as important. And in terms of governance, we have to include also the local dimension. Cities are crucial in attracting and managing drones, and they are interested, smart cities, want to move from projects and big ideas towards concrete measures to, sol to help them solve congestion and to improve the quality of living in city centers. The discussions over the last uh, two days and the whole Amsterdam Drone Week confirmed that on new space, there's still a clash of ideas ongoing on some aspects, and that's good. But we all agree, and it is crystal clear, that only new space can really open the drone services market at this stage. New space will pave the way for longer distance and more complex operations that are to come. We have, <clears throat> we have been following the whole discussion uh, and consultation process. Last Tuesday, or a couple of days ago, during the meeting of the new space demonstrator network, I heard a clear call for keeping up the momentum on Wednesday, I heard mayors of smart cities trying to translate smart ideas into concrete solutions, and drones are part of those solutions. And so we, we must make sure that U-Space gives those smart cities the opportunity to develop the solutions. So what is now our main take on U-Space? 
the topic for the next months and next year. Well, first, also looking back at the debates and discussions we've had over the last uh, days, it's clear to me that we need a, a flexible and performance-based regulatory framework to accommodate and accompany the market development that is taking place. We must avoid a chicken and egg situation between the regulatory development on the one hand and the market development on the other. In order to create a positive investment climate, they need to evolve in parallel. Secondly, I think it's clear also that use space is not ATM 2.0. It's not a new way of supporting communication between a pilot and an air traffic controller. It's about feeding highly automated or autonomous drones with information so that drones can navigate safely. And what are then the services that U-Space must provide? Generally speaking, the services must deliver the necessary information that the navigating system needs and that enables automation in a safe way. And we believe that these services can and should be provided in a competitive market. The essential feature of use space that is, is that every actor in the system must cooperate and must be visible to the others. Call it cooperation, call it conspicuity, but use space needs to be what, that we know who is flying where and where to. We cannot have blind spots. And this implies that all traffic managed by use space, uh, whether it's interaction between manned and unmanned, they will all have to make themselves visible in the use space, whatever the technology and become cooperative. And of course, the connections should be instantaneous and automatic. Integration. Integration is one of the buzzwords that we hear most frequently also in the last two days. And I think here there are two aspects we need to get our heads around. First, the question is whether use space should be able to manage both manned and unmanned traffic. As an objective, I would say my answer must be yes at least in terms of cooperating in a digital way. But I immediately add, of course, we have to make sure it's safe by setting robust safety performance standards and by setting certification requirements for those service providers where needed. And the robustness of those requirements will have to evolve with the traffic density and complexity that uh, is ahead of us. Secondly, integration uh, often also refers to the relation between use space and ATM. Will ATM with its specific rules and procedures operate in the same airspace as use space? This is an important question and I think none of the panels we heard was definitively able to answer this question. Clearly it's about safety, about liability and efficiency and we need concrete solutions. What we certainly need, and this would be my big plea today, is to start to continue and to finish work on the use space. We have to, the market is waiting for it. We need a European framework to have a market with sufficient critical mass, a harmonized environment of 500 million citizens and many businesses in order to attract investment uh, to this sector. And the smart way to develop the use space is to start to designate particular volumes that will be covered by use space and to let the system gradually evolve. We heard the word evolve quite a few times. Evolve according to the density and the complexity of the air traffic in that particular volume. The challenge would be for the regulator and the certifying authorities to raise the bar of the safety requirements gradually in line with the density and complexity and growing risk. And all that, as I've heard and learned, to be done in an open architecture an architecture that allows us to profit also from the increased technological sophistication over time. It will help us to continue to provide the European citizen with high and harmonized safety levels going forward. They expect no less, certainly from aviation. But we must also remember to look beyond safety. For security, we must apply the most recent cybersecurity standards especially as use space is all about data. Data should be encrypted. Data should not be shared with everybody, but only with uh, relevant actors. Uh, and we need to ensure privacy uh, by design. Without high security performance, we risk not to have open data or an open architecture, and we risk to fragment the European market. Environment will also be crucial 
Let's remember that, as I already mentioned. We will use existing environmental requirements to manage the impact and push towards the decarbonization of transport. And all those elements are key for societal acceptance. A takeaway uh, that we have also from the last two days is that societal acceptan acceptance will be essential. And this is not a one-off task, it's a continuous task. We need to engage with communities and respond to their feedback on an ongoing basis. So against that background, we are of course eagerly awaiting the formal EASA opinion. They have received, as you know, thousands of comments. A lot of work uh, is, is created by those comments, but I see it as a good sign. It means that what we are doing is relevant, and it means that the community is very engaged in what we are doing. Once we have the uh, EASA opinion, we will start discussions uh, from the Commission side in the EASA committee with the member states, uh, and of course, uh, these discussions with the member states will determine the speed with which we will then be able to adopt uh, the use space regulation in its first iteration, enabling, uh, creating an enabling framework, and hopefully this can be done uh, by the end of next year, as Patrick was mentioning, uh, in the worst case, I would say early uh, 21. So, to conclude, I would like to join what Eduardo just said in the previous panel. Let's just do it. Thank you for your attention. Again, thanks also to the teams of Patrick Key uh, and for the conference here uh, and receiving us in Amsterdam, Paul Riemer of the RAI. Thanks for the impeccable organization uh, of this conference uh, and thank you in advance for your continued engagement and contributions to our further work on drones and on new space in particular. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now we're getting towards our close. Just for the closing remarks, I'd like to invite Patrick Key back to the stage. Thank you, Janet. It's me again. Sorry about that. Uh, but um, I wanted to maybe uh, share with you the conclusions uh, on, on these very intense and I hope successful two days. I've personally enjoyed uh, this conference and I, hope, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I, I did. The subject of the conference was um, scaling drone operations and we have analyzed the status of impl implementation of the new drones regulation for the open and specific categories in panel one. There is a general agreement um, that uh, the implementation is going on, but there are a certain number of challenges. Typically, to transition from national to EU regulation, uh, challenges with operators re registration and on the establishment of uh, geographical zones. The national um, aviation authorities will need to address those new actors by doing what we call safety promotion um, um, campaigns, which are basically to explain uh, the community on what the new rules are doing and what they mean. And we also recognized that there was still a lot of work that needs to be done on industry standards in order to support a harmonized implementation of the rule. So. It's ongoing, but there is still a lot of work which needs to be performed, not necessarily only at the European level, but also at the national level. In the panel two, uh, we looked at uh, what needs to be done in order to enable more complex operations, such as urban air mobility. And the panel concluded that the UAM is about creating an ecosystem which will allow to operate the aircraft safely the safety objectives need to be a set, set at the highest standards to ensure societal acceptance and avoid killing the concept again, like uh, in the 60s, and this was something which was mentioned, helicopters which were flying above Manhattan until there were fatal accidents and then um, uh, 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 very strong restrictions on any such operations. UAM is a key step towards sustainable aviation and mobility, and it may still take time to become a reality, but the good news is that there is a lot of work going on between the industry and regulators, and that we have never been 
closer than today on UAM. In panel three, um, we looked, and this was a very important panel, we looked at the societal aspects of uh, drones. And, and basically, there was a recognition that the societal acceptance goes beyond safety and encompasses privacy issues, security, sustainability, and in particular, noise. And it was uh, recognized that uh, quiet and carbon neutral drones will be a key success factor. And there, the most um, useful tool, again, is going to be education and communication, in particular to educate clueless future operators or pilots with the support of tools uh, which are accessible and familiar, such as using uh, smartphone apps. We need to reach out to the community, not letting them sit with their concerns, but explain the benefits that drones can have for the society. Today, we discussed uh, about use space, challenges and opportunities, uh, and uh, what we should do in order to achieve US integration. And I don't need to uh, summarize what uh, happened today, I guess. I, I just wanted to mention that we had uh, the pleasure this year to have a very wide representation of the international community. There were something like uh, 75 um, uh, countries which were represented today, and uh, people coming from very far away, from Singapore, from Asia, uh, from the US, and I would like to thank Jay, who is uh, around, for, for coming uh, to participate in this, uh, in this uh, discussion. The conference this year, I, uh, I, I hope, has shown that um, we are really working in partnership between institutions, member states, Eurocontrol, César Undertaking and the industry, and that it's only through working together that we can achieve the very short timescales that we have achieved so far. We have also seen that there is still a lot of work that needs to be done and on which this partnership will need to be maintained. And I can assure you that uh, we uh, in EASA are committed to continue to work together with you in making uh, all the relevant work to make um, drones uh, a big success for the society. I would like to thank Paul Riemens and the RAI team for the excellent organization of this event and for the splendid facilities that uh, they have provided to us. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the EASA team. And uh, just to come back to what uh, Philippe Merlot was saying, we have a program and we have a, a, a program team. Maybe can I ask all the drone team to join us, join me here on the stage? Don't be shy, come. All of you, there are some who are hiding still. Rebecca, where are you? Janet, come. So we were, we were criticized uh, on social media uh, because of the lack of diversity uh, in this conference. Um, first of all, you know, I've, I've been uh, for uh, uh, quite, uh, quite uh, some time in my life fighting against uh, racism and making sure that we have diversity uh, in, in the society. And I hope that uh, we can show to you that uh, this is a diverse team and uh, that uh, at least as far as we are concerned and in the drone community there is no issue in terms of diversity. And finally, I would like to say to you that uh, this team is working extremely hard for you. And if you are unhappy uh, with EASA, don't be unhappy with me, be unhappy with them. Okay. <laughs> and uh, can you uh, give me a hand and, and give a, a big round of applause for the drone team? Thank you very much. Um, have a safe trip back. Um, <laughs> if you travel by train to France, um, check your <laughs> schedule. Uh, there were some, uh, uh, <laughs> some surprises yesterday for some of our colleagues. And now I give you the floor, Janet. Okay, just a couple of things from me and then lunch is waiting outside. 
We're now wrapping up the high-level conference for this year. Some people have asked about the videos that are being taken at the back there. We expect to have them on our website on Monday, so if you want to see it again or show it to colleagues, that'll be available for you. And that's the same with the presentations as well. I hope they'll be there by Monday, but if not, then in subsequent days. This afternoon, we have the technical workshops. You can see up there in E102 and E103. That's upstairs from here. They'll start at 2 o'clock. Thank you all for attending, and nothing now between you and lunch. Thank you. Thank you.